biggest daytime tornado I've seen. On a wild May day in 2015, this stationary supercell in the Texas Panhandle became a memorable event for countless storm chasers as it went on to produce tornado after tornado over the course of about an hour and a half. All right, keep going some more, keep going some more. In this video, we will look back at my chase day, decisions made, and the meteorology that went into creating this Texas tornado producing machine. During the end of our chasecation trip in 2015, which has been, up to this point, the best we ever had. The pattern in May featured broad southwesterly flow across the central and southern plains, sitting atop an abundant supply of moisture. That's it. I think that was it. It was big. Three days prior, on May 24th, we saw a few tornadoes, including this nighttime wedge near Plains, Kansas. This was rated EF1, narrowly missing most structures, preventing a higher rating. The wedge was 4,290 feet wide, or about eight tenths of a mile. Motion is very strong. A few days later, on May 26, high precipitation supercells west of the Dallas Fort Worth metro gave us another tornado near Cato, Texas. It's coming down again. Yes! Oh my gosh. Wow. Enter May 27th. 2015. Trying to keep our success streak alive, an enhanced risk was issued for the Texas Panhandle extending northward into western Kansas. The enhanced risk was primarily for large hail, with an additional 5% tornado risk over the area as well. The target was quite obvious from a storm chasing perspective. Instability was significant, with a 4,000 joule per kilogram mixed layer bullseye of Cape in the eastern Texas Panhandle. The environment was likely uncapped as early as 3 p.m., allowing storms to form. Dew points pushed into the mid and upper 60s with a back surface wind about 10 to 15 knots from the southeast, while high above at 500 millibar, westerly winds were in place but only at about 20 knots. While the directional shear in the atmosphere was great, the speed shear was limited. Bulk shear values barely hit 30 knots, but this weak upper level support also meant storms would be crawling today, easy to chase. At 2.36 p.m., a severe thunderstorm warning was issued, and while we were running behind, we were still about an hour away. At 3.23 p.m., a tornado warning was issued for a storm spotter reported funnel cloud. This funnel cloud. Alright, keep going some more, keep going some more. Do it right stop right here, stop right here, stop right here, stop right here. Perfect shot, perfect. Wow, <laughs> that escalated quickly. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Like that right there. Oh, it's starting to come out again. How many? Oh boy, here we go. Put on like a really beautiful elephant truck. Awesome. After several funnel clouds, the storm went for a period of weakening, remaining stationary just northwest of Canadian. This slow movement was noted in the warning text for the storm. The initial warning had the storm moving southeast at 20 miles per hour. At 4.02 p.m., a continuation of the warning remarked that the storm was moving east at just 5 miles per hour. Decisions had to be made regarding how best to chase the storm. The storm had up to baseball-sized hail around the base, and with torrential rainfall also occurring, flash flooding was a concern on the only roadway that allowed us to get closer. North of Highway US 83, roads were small dirt roads for the oil and gas industry, effectively making this a road hole with no options to get closer. 
Despite being late initially, we are well ahead of the storm chasing festival that continued to grow by the minute as this became increasingly likely as the storm of the day. We pushed a little closer, right to the edge of the hail core, right as the storm appeared to kick out outflow. Did this storm just become outflow dominant and are we done here? What appeared to be happening was actually a cell merger. A small storm popped up south of the parent circulation and got ingested into the updraft region. Countless studies show that this process can induce tornado genesis in roughly the next 10 to 15 minutes. This cell merger also forced the parent storm to gain some forward momentum to the east. While not a significant storm motion, this increase in forward movement could also help increase the storm relative inflow. Additionally, the previously stable stationary nature of the storm allowed the surrounding environment to cool with blocked sunshine and higher surface moisture. This allowed the LCL heights, or the cloud bases to put it simply, to lower from about 1200 meters to 800 meters, another factor that could make tornado formation faster. So with the forward speed increase, the question is now go north of Canadian and let it get close to us, potentially let it get east of the road by the time it produces a tornado, cutting off our view, or we could give the storm time to get better organized and be in a better position to view the storm by dropping south and east east of Canadian on Highway 33. We actually made the decision to go south and east originally, but we collectively decided to turn around and give it another chance for repositioning. A fateful, wise decision. Yep, I see it. So close. Tornado. Definitely tornado. Big tornado. Oh, there we go, baby. There we go. Tornado on the ground. Cone tornado on the ground, baby. <laughs> Woo! Yes! Oh my gosh. Hey, I can make Okay, go for it. Okay. This is the biggest daytime tornado I've seen. <laughs> Violent. We just about left the storm too. Holy crap. Oh, it's gonna be positioned, yeah. Yeah. We're actually gonna go for one of the like north. Yeah. Well good thing we gave the storm a second chance, huh? Yeah. Okay, I'm good, I'm good. Redwind is good to go. The first tornado was the strongest and largest of the sequence. The 14 minute twister was 1200 yards wide at its peak, but 7 tenths of a mile, nearly stationary, just going back and forth over the same area. What we did not know at the time is that this tornado was impacting a storm shelter, housing 40 people inside. Three people trapped outside the shelter were injured, two critically, and had to be airlifted out. The tornado was described as, quote, moving slightly east and back west before moving back east into their structure, according to survivors. This is all that's left of a manufactured home where two people were critically hurt. If that wasn't enough for the poor people trapped by the tornado, all survived significant flooding which occurred after the tornado. Right, I'm ready to fuck on the left side. I'm having to fuck on the left right there. But the supercell was not done yet. We have a classic supercell right now. Major rotation is wall cloud. Classic inflow going into this wall cloud right now. This storm did produce a tornado about 30, 40 minutes ago. A really large cone tornado. It's cycling again. It's trying to produce another tornado. I think we're going to head north and try to get a better advantage on this thing. The storm stalled once again just north of Canadian, and just like the last event, more cell mergers were evident on radar, which is a likely major contributor to the next round of tornadoes. Looking at forecast soundings at the time, you can clearly see why these storms were essentially stationary. Storm motion vectors were under 5 knots. Looking at the overall wind profile, there was robust directional shear, especially in the lowest three kilometers of the atmosphere, but overall magnitude was on the lower side, keeping these tornadoes from becoming beasts and threatening the city of Canadian. Tornado!
drop a ride on. Looks like it's still on the ground, although I can't see coming out. Might still be on the ground. Some seal condense on the ground. Oh, it's on the ground. Yeah, it's definitely on the ground. On the ground. Nick, we need to go north and drop. Let's drop another one. Oh, that's creepy. The Canadian Texas tornado and that whole storm chasing day remains one of my favorites, even though it's nearly 10 years ago at this point. It was one of the easier storm chasing days because our total displacement was maybe five miles over the course of seven hours. We watched at least four tornadoes drop from this nearly stationary supercell. And in terms of a forecasting standpoint, we learned a lot about storm chasing. At that point in time, I was really only storm chasing for a couple of years, and this was one of my first big adventures into Tornado Alley. We learned so much on logistics, positioning, storm structure, and evolution. And so if there are, are any meteorology students out there potentially watching this that are in college, I do encourage you to storm chase safely, of course, and of course, with somebody that actually knows what they're doing, because it's one thing forecasting and reading in college from textbooks and things like that, but a totally different thing if you have to actively forecast in the field to get in a position for some of Mother Nature's most furious things. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you did find it interesting. I enjoyed looking back at this. If you are a fan of the channel and you've kind of been following along for a while, maybe you've seen some of my storm chases either live or on my kind of yearly roundup documentaries. If you're interested in more of a deeper dive into one of the days that sometimes only cover maybe two to three minutes inside one of those documentaries, let me know what day you're interested in in the comments down below. I've been chasing since about 2011. I have a lot of different storm chases, although I don't it out as much as some of the big names in the community someday maybe thanks for watching everybody if you like this video please give it a like it really does help me out feel free to subscribe if you're not already for more videos we'll see you again in the next one thanks for watching everybody